showing you how Jesus had to deal with emotions. And uh, I'll start off tonight by showing you that, you know, even God dealt with this. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, verse 8 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So the first thing I understand here from this scripture is that love is an emotion, but love is not just an emotion, it also involves other emotions. That's so important. And so uh, you, you see God who is love, and God who is love, you'll see a lot of other emotions that go along uh, with God who is love. And then Ephesians chapter four, Ephesians chapter four, and verse three, and he says, endeavoring to keep, Ephesians chapter four, excuse me, verse 30. I apologize, Ephesians four and 30. You'll see here in verse 30 that the Spirit of God has, the Holy Spirit, and he says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Well, grief is an emotion. <laughs> grief is an emotion, it's a feeling of loss. And he says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So between Jesus and what I showed you in the Garden of Gethsemane, between God, who is love, and between the Holy Spirit, who can be grieved, the entire Trinity indicates that there are emotions involved in their very existence. Now, as I said before, we all have emotions, but unfortunately, sometimes those emotions have us. But emotions... You know, if you read the Bible carefully, you see that, that uh, God can be jealous, it talks about him being jealous, that God can be angry. The Bible says that uh, in lots of places, uh, referring to the anger of the Lord was kindled. So, you know, there's no way we can try to convince you that you have emotions and yet God has emotions. Now, emotions were given to us for our enjoyment. Emotions were given and they are meant for our enjoyment. We were created in God's image and part of that likeness of God is emotions. You know, God, God is a God who has emotions. It's all through the Bible. And as we were created in God's image, uh, Genesis 1:31. go there, Genesis 1:31. We're created in God's image. Look at what Genesis 1:31 has to say about his creation. He said, and God saw everything that he had made, that includes us, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So everything that God made was very good. He made everything in his image, which means also where, his, where emotions are concerned. So emotions were created to be good. If everything that God created was good, then those emotions that we have been given by God in the likeness of God, Think of that now. We've been given emotions in the likeness of God. These emotions are good. They were given to us to, for enjoyment. Now, we've got to find hope for emotional stability. That's the key. The emotions are good. They were designed to be good. It is designed for our enjoyment. In a moment, we're going to switch over and show you why they're not so good in a lot of places. But one of the things that we see very clearly in the church, we see the difference between people trying to cope with emotions, the church teaching people to cope with depression, cope with these different feelings, and not teaching them how to control these emotions. Uh, we're part of the reason why a lot of people in the church don't think you can control your emotions. You know, as a, as a, as a former therapist, I, we used to teach you to cope with certain things and even entering to the ministry, teaching people how to cope with certain things. No, no, no. We want to move from coping to controlling these things. If God gave you these emotions, and these emotions are a, a, a very duplication of God himself and emotions he possessed, he wants us to control them, to have authority over our emotions and not just to cope with our emotions. You know, if I were to have people to stand up on a Sunday morning and ask the question, how many of you here today uh, have dealt with or dealing with depression and you need prayer for that? You might find 80, 85, 90% of the church would stand up dealing with that situation. But, you know, that's not kind of bought up in church. 
And what we need to understand is that mental and emotional health is a part of what Jesus came to bring us. A part of what Jesus came to deal with us on the cross and shed his blood is so we can have mental and emotional health. And let's look at our society right now. I mean, look at a lot of things that are going on. A lot of things, we have a mental health issue in our country today. And, you know, the church should be the place where we're giving answers to that. Well, why not? Because you got a lot of mental health issues in the pulpit. And you got mental health and emotional issues in the church. And if we don't start talking about it, there won't be faith to begin to deal with that. But look what he says in Isaiah 26 and verse 3. You know, speaking of this fact that it is the will of God, Jesus came to bring us emotional and mental health. That's a part of it. We, 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 preached about, we preach about Jesus making us healthy in our physical bodies, okay? And, and we're talking about prospering in our soul. Now we're talking about being healthy in our emotions. Isaiah 26 and 3. And he says, thou will keep him, listen to what he says, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Well, peace is an emotion, isn't it? And you can live in a state of emotional peace. Notice the scripture says, I'll keep you in perfect peace. That, that's just, that's hopeful right there. That, that just lets you know that there is a way through God for us to, to enter into a state of perfect peace. I'll say out loud, say, I, I receive a, a, a stability in my emotions. I receive stability in my emotions. And I receive perfect peace. And I receive perfect peace. Now, he, he tells us here how to do that. Thou keep him in perfect peace. He says, wherever your mind is stayed, that's going to be big tonight. Wherever your mind, your thoughts, your emotions, all of that is going to determine where your emotions are going to be. What are your thoughts? If, you're, if your mind is on Jesus, your mind is on the Word of God, then you know you're going to be able to govern those thoughts. Now, I, I want to show you something. That, just a little foundation. I want to show you something that we're going to deal with tonight. It's quite fast, fascinating to me when I saw this. But let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. And, and, and again, we're dealing with this issue of can I really control my emotions? Or are, they, are, or are emotions just a response to negative situations? And I don't have, I can't control it. You know, do I, do I not have a choice in, 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 in deciding what kind of emotions are in my life? Well, look at this. This is pretty fascinating. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, here it is a section where they're talking about how God would judge sin and, you know, the things that he would do. And in Deuteronomy 28, verse 40, Cisco started verse 46 through 48. Deuteronomy 28, uh, actually, let's look at 45. Deuteronomy 28, 45, and let's go through 48. Now, listen to this carefully. He says, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee, and they're going to overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes uh, which he commanded. Now listen to this now. In the old covenant, God judged sin harshly. He judged sin harshly. But in the new covenant, um, our judgment has been placed upon Jesus Christ. So even though your behavior is not always right, the judgment comes on Jesus Christ. You have to get that. God's not judging your sins harshly today like he did in the Old Testament. Why? Because Jesus has been judged for all of our sins. That's a, that's a powerful thing. That's, that's something to say, thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So we still benefit in seeing what the Lord judged as a wrong type of conduct. So this is going to kind of catch you off guard a little bit. This is amazing. Look at verse 46 now. So we know he judges sin. He's in the old covenant now, and he's judging sin. And let's check out what he's about to judge. Uh, Deuteronomy 28, uh, 46, he says, And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wandering upon thy seed forever. 47. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. I mean, you know, joyfulness is an emotion. Gladness is an emotion. He's getting ready to judge them because they didn't serve him with the emotion of gladness and joy 
for all the things that he's done. Wow. Look at the next verse. He says, therefore, shall thou serve thine enemy, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. And notice he is judging them because they did not serve God with joyfulness and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things that he had given them. He's judging them because they didn't respond correctly in their emotions. Now think about this for a moment. He, he, he's, he's come before these guys and he's saying, listen, you know, most people look at emotions as being like optional. They look at it as just like, you know, it's just something that happens. I want to, I want to take you down a little pro progression. I want you to think about it. A bad circumstances will show up in your life. Most people, most people believe that if something negative happens, there must be a negative emotion to correspond with that negative circumstance. That's what most people think. Something negative happens, then a negative emotion must correspond with that negative circumstance. They see emotions as simply as, as a response and not a choice. So the, a bad negative circumstance happened, most people see, well, bad circumstance, bad emotions, and that's a response to the bad circumstances and they don't see it as being a choice. They don't see it as you can choose how you feel even though the circumstance is negative. A negative circumstance does not, does not necessarily mean you have to have negative emotions to correspond with that negative circumstance. But most people think that. So to them, emotions are not something they have any authority or control over. And that's true with most people. They don't think you have authority or control over your emotions. Uh, they feel like, well, you know, therefore they don't have any responsibility for their, for their emotions. And, and there's a lot of people in the world today. I don't think I have responsibility for my emotions. You don't understand. The reason why I got mad and shot them because they did that. So you just, you just let me go free. And, and they don't see themselves as being responsible for it. They, they see emotion, negative emotions as a, as a response to the negative circumstance. And I am telling you, it's a choice. Not just a response, it's a choice. And so what happens in the current day thinking, here's the current day thinking, here's our current day thinking. And it is this that emotions are just something that happens. Emotions are just something that happens. It, it, it based on, it's based on circumstance, but emotions just happen. That is a gigantic deception. You, you gotta get that out of your head. Emotions don't just happen. You are a free moral agent and you can choose uh, how and, and, and you, you want your, your emotions to be in the midst of a negative situation. But as long as you think that the negative circumstance means that you have to have a negative emotion to correspond with it, it it's gonna ruin it. No wonder the devil wants to use emotions to, to take you where he wants you to go. Because you, first of all, don't think you have any authority, or let me put it like this, you don't think you have control over how you feel. And you do. You don't think you have control over how you feel, and you do have control over how you feel. And, and like I said before, most people look at these emotions as being optional, just something that happens. And yet, that cannot be true. That cannot be true because of what we just read. Because if you didn't have any control over your emotions, and if you didn't have any authority over your feelings, then it would not be right for God to judge these people of not responding with the right emotion if they didn't have control over it. For him to just, to, to judge them and to allow this curse to come on them because they didn't respond right emotionally, because they didn't respond with joy and gladness because of what God has done. Re please realize something. They were being cursed because they had the wrong emotional response. God was saying, you're supposed to respond to me with joy and gladness because of all the good things that I've done unto you. And he says, because you didn't do it, which means that's a choice. He's expecting for you to choose to 
to respond this way, which means it's a choice. And he says, because it is a choice and you didn't choose to honor me with your emotions the right way, I am going to judge you and curse you for it. Now, of course, he will not do that under the new covenant, but under the old covenant, they were judged and cursed. You saw what happened to them because they didn't respond to God correctly emotionally. And I'm telling you, because of just this right here, there is no way you can, 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 can justify God cursing these people if they didn't have a choice to choose the type of emotion they were supposed to have regardless of the circumstance that came. So, before I go on, turn to your neighbor and tell him to wake up because we're going to get into this, man. <laughs> Amen. You got you to gotta stay up on this. I can't be hollering and screaming at you, messing my voice up, trying to keep you awake. God, can, God uh, that you cannot allow your emotions to control you. You're supposed to control your emotions. But if you don't think you have any control of your emotions, guess what happens? They end up controlling you. And you end up telling people, well, my emotions, I did this because that happened, and, and so I felt this way. You, you got, you, let me tell you, the devil will eat your lunch if you do not come to the place of realizing that your emotions are not just a response to a, a negative situation. Your emotions are something that God gave you that you have authority over. Say out loud, I have authority over how I feel. Say out loud, I can control how I feel. All right, look at this. Go to John chapter 14 and verse 1. John chapter 14 and verse 1. Look at what he says here. You not having authority over your emotions is a lie. It's a lie. Look what he says here. Let not your heart be troubled. <laughs> How are you even going to tell me this if, unless you understand that I have the power and authority in the middle of trouble to not be troubled? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So again, there's no way God would be justified in even asking us to let not our heart be troubled. See, here's Jesus getting ready to go to the cross. He knows his disciples are going to go through a lot of trouble, and he begins to warn them. He says, guys, you know, trouble's coming. And, and this, is, this was not a suggestion. This was a command. Let not your heart be troubled, is what he was telling them. It was a command. How do you command somebody to take authority over your emotions if you did not have control over your emotions. And he commands them to do it. Of course, they didn't do it. They were full of trouble. He had to eventually come and minister to them, get them all healed up. But the fact of the matter is they could have. And just because trouble comes, that's the circumstance, doesn't mean you have to respond with an equal negative emotion to match that circumstance. I wrote a book, I think I wrote a book, yeah I did, I wrote a book, how, how something about trouble your trouble. Yeah, how to trouble your trouble. I, 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 knew even, I, I knew even back then that just because you're in trouble, you don't have to be troubled by your trouble because you had authority over your emotions. And you have got, you know, many people think, well, you know, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. It doesn't matter the trouble you've seen. You have authority of your emotions. You can decide the, with the type of emotions you're going to have in the midst of those troubles. Let me show you this again. Uh, go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. It is a lie for anybody to tell you that you don't have control over your emotions. That is a lie. You control how you feel. You control how you feel. You need to let yourself know that because most of the time when you're going off, you're going off because you don't think you have any control. You have a control. You, you know, my wife says something that was so amazing. She says, you determine how people treat you. He says, you decide how people treat you. It's not even the fact sometimes that people are mean to you. You decide how people treat you and you decide how you want to be treated. If you're going to stand there and just be disrespected, that's your decision. I don't stand in the place somebody disrespect me. They're they, they, they going to have to talk to themselves. I got to go. Now, you can be cussing, but you're going to be cussing somebody else out because I'm gone. 
Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death. I've set blessings and cursings. Therefore, what did he say? Choose life that both thou and thy seed may live and prosper. This is simply talking about this wonderful gift to be a free moral agent and to make a choice that you and I can choose. You can make a choice. We do have authority over our emotions through Jesus Christ, and it is time to walk in that authority and take control of our feelings. That is authority you have. Take control of your feelings. Turn to two people and say, take control of your feelings. Is everybody with me so far? So you, you, can, you can sit in any kind of situation and just feel a certain way and just let that feeling torment you, dominate you, create even more emotions to go along with that. And you'd be surprised how much defeat you walk in just by sitting at home and, uh, and allowing those negative feelings to minister to you. You'd be surprised. By the time you walk out, bet not nobody say nothing to you because you're already prompt and ready to respond because you wouldn't take control over how you feel. Please listen to all of this. I'm, I've, I've got to set this foundation up in order for you to understand where I'm going. Now, what about the natural versus the supernatural? Where we're talking about where emotions are concerned. You can bring your emotions under spiritual dominion. You can bring your emotions under the spiritual dominion of Jesus Christ rather than under the physical dominion of the world. And you've got to choose. Are, are my emotions going to be bought under the spiritual dominion or are my emotions going to be bought under the dominion of the world? Now, I don't believe that God intends for us to live by what the natural realm dictates. I don't believe God wants us to live by the circumstances that show up in our lives on a daily basis. And most of the time, the circumstance is not the problem. How you respond, your feelings and your emotions become a bigger problem than the circumstance. And so in the natural, there's this thing called humanism. I know you've heard of it that says we all have the answer within ourselves. We don't need God. That's the humanistic view, that man in himself as a human can do anything, and he has the answers on the inside of himself. They don't think that the answer to our problems is in the spiritual part of us, because most of them don't know there's a spiritual part of us. And that's where the answers are, the answers in the, in the area where the spiritual part of us. But they think that it's just in the mental and the emotional part. And psychologists will deal with you in those two realms, your mental and emotional part. They think that's where the answer is, but the answer to a lot of issues are right there in your spirit where wisdom grows. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. It's right there where wisdom grows, not just in your mental and your emotions, but we have something that the world doesn't have, the understanding that we have power in our spirit. And if we submit our emotions to the spiritual realm, to the supernatural realm, rather than submitting our emotions to the natural realm. See, if you submit your emotions, basically you're saying, such and such, such and so fail like that, so it's all right for me to feel like that. I'm just like everybody else. Or you can say, no, that's not what Jesus says. I'm gonna submit my emotions to the Word of God and the Spirit of God, and I'm gonna not allow my emotions to dominate me in this natural world. Genesis 1, 26 says, and God said, let us make man in our what? Image, after our likeness, let them have dominion over fish of the sea, fowl of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. He created male and female. He created them. We were not created to stand alone. He created them. Now, I'm mentioning that because you got to be careful when you're trying to deal with your emotions that you don't decide that, well, I don't need anybody. I've been hurt by too many people. I've been disappointed by too many people, so I'm going to resign myself from relationships and I'm going to figure it out myself. We were created to be together with somebody. When you do that, you're going to miss out on one of the greatest gifts that God wants to give you, and that is the awesome stuff that comes from relationships. And that also includes the ability to mature and to grow and to recognize things about yourself that you would not be able to recognize except you were in a relationship with somebody else. And uh, no man's an island, that's a true statement, not a scripture, but I do agree with it 100%.
that um, the objective is not to become emotionless and then hide behind scripture as if you don't have issues. You're going to have an issue. You've got to learn. See, you don't, you don't want to get in a place where you're so by yourself that you become so self-centered and you use your hurts and your pains as an excuse to not develop relationships with people. That's not why God created us. We are the body of Christ and we should have a connection and relationship with somebody. You should see these faces. You see these faces. Because I know what you're thinking. Like, you don't, you don't understand. You don't understand how bad I've been hurt. But you don't understand you have a choice to determine what you're going to do with how you feel. You can take something that happened 20 years ago and keep it today. Or you can leave that 20 years behind. And, you know, like I'm freaking out on the stuff on the news, the guy that's trying to, you know, get into a judge. And I, I'm freaking out because this world is such a trip. Go all the way back to high school. If you went back to my high school, I ain't no telling what you, what you going to high school. Ain't no telling what you're going to find in high school. I can't even be responsible for high school. You're not the same person as you were in high school. You see how freaked out this world is? And it's, and it's such, it's so hypocritical. Who wants to go all the way back in high school? I'm so messed up in high school, I don't remember half the parties I went to. There were some days I don't even know what happened in them hours. I just woke up somewhere that wasn't my house. And, and we, have a, we have a hypocritical world that I go back and do that you 50, almost 60 some years old, and you're going to say you're no good today because of what you did all the way. Now, now, now please don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm, whatever was wrong in high school was probably wrong today, but God, dog, can a person get better? Because if a person can't get better, what you're saying is that you have to be perfect to serve. And that ain't what the Bible says. Moses killed a man, and God used him awesomely. Paul in his arrogant, Pharisee-ish way, had people killed. Look at David, the king. See, God seemed to use those people like that, but the world don't want to use those people like that because I think they're trying to hide their own. That's impossible. There's no way. I don't know nobody like that. And y'all in church, and I don't want to go back 30 years in your past because we go find something. Can I get a witness? <laughs> so if, if I'm up and somebody, you know, trying to take me through a trial, what were you like in high school? A fool, demon possessed? <laughs> What'd you do? Everything you can probably think of that was wrong. What are you going to do with those feelings? Do you bring all that stuff up with you now and let it choose to continue to dominate your life like it did 30 years ago? Or now that you're saved, which is big deal. It's a big deal now that you're saved. Old things have passed away. Come on. Behold, all things have become new. You are a new creation in Christ. Amen. Now, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7. <clears throat> All right, now, I'm going to ease into this. I, I, I'm, this is so important. Verse uh, 6, he says, be careful or don't be anxious. He's talking about an emotion here. Don't be anxious for nothing. Don't be anxious, anxiety. Don't be anxious for nothing, but in everything, he said, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Okay, don't be anxious, but make your, take it to God. And he says, and what happens is when you do that, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your heart, and it'll keep your mind through Christ Jesus. It'll keep your emotions. What he's saying is, is no matter what's going on, take it to God, focus in on him, and for us, we have something that the world doesn't have, 
a way to stabilize our emotions, a way and a person we can go to to stabilize our emotion. Where do you go through in the midst of a bad circumstance and the emotions are just getting ready to pop off? He says, go to God. Focus immediately on God and his word. That is what you have to harness your emotions and to keep your emotions stable. Now, if you don't make use of that as Christians, then your emotions will just pop off just like the world because they're not going to God. They're going to logic. They're going to humanism. You and I, we can control our emotions because we are going to focus on God when our emotions try to do something they don't need to be doing. So first base, I need to put my focus on God, not the circumstance. I need to put it on God. And that's so easier said than done because I know a lot of us, we don't do that right away. That's not the first thing you think about, but eventually you got to come to the point of saying, before this thing pops off, I've got to get God. Even, even just say something, Jesus, help me, something that will help get your emotions to a place where they're submitted to God. All right, now, now remember John 14 and 1. The Lord doesn't expect us to have positive emotions only when everything is going our way. John 14 and 1 says, I want you to have good emotions when you're in trouble. I want you to have good emotions when things are not going your way. He's not expecting for us just to have positive emotions just when everything's going our way. And basically, that's what the world has been taught, including the church. Hey, when everything's going good, I'm good. But Jesus is saying, no, I want you to have the right emotions when things are not going your way. That, that's what makes us holy. We, we, we separate ourselves from how the world governs their emotions and how we do it. We won't do it. We, the world says, well, the circumstance is bad, uh, emotion's bad. Uh, Christians say circumstance is bad, but I choose to have these kind of emotions that line up with the Word of God. That's what makes us holy. Holiness is all, always about not being common with the world. That's what holiness is. Holiness is I'm, not, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be doing opposite what the world's gonna be doing and conduct myself that way. Now, let me show you this, John 16, 33. Oh, this is a fascinating journey we're taking here tonight. Praise God. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world, you're going to have what? In the world, you're going to have what? Excuse my English, but what is it you're going to have in this world? Some trouble, right? So why do you keep getting surprised? Like it's not supposed to come upon you. Watch this. And the first time trouble comes on you, you start blaming yourself for the trouble. You remember you're under the grace of God. God is not responding to your behavior. He's responding to your belief. Are you listening to me? And you keep, every time something happens to you, you want to blame yourself for it. Oh, I couldn't pay this bill. I must have did something to deserve this. You, you don't understand what this grace is about. Oh, you know, if I'd have prayed a little longer, then this might not have happened. I did something to make this happen to me. That's, you're under the grace of God. You're not under the law where sin was judged harshly. So when we are facing trials and tribulations, we are commanded to be of what? Good cheer because Jesus has overcome the world. He says, you know what? In the middle of trouble, I command you. What is he saying? Take authority of your emotions. Talk to your soul. Soul, bless the Lord. Be of good cheer. When's the last time you did that? When's the last time when you thought, I'm going to bite the bullet? And you said, you know what? Soul, be of good cheer. It's a powerful thing if you just open your mouth and do it. It's a powerful thing in the middle of a crazy situation if you'll just open your mouth and do it. Be of good cheer. What are you doing? You're talking to your soul. You're talking to your emotions. David, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. I don't feel like blessing it. I'm having a horrible day, but I'm, that's not what I'm going to choose. Bless the Lord. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer, boy. You'd be amazed of the spiritual interaction that takes place when you take authority and command your emotions to line up with, with the Word of God instead of lining up with the circumstance. Now, our emotional stability doesn't depend upon circumstances or how things are going. If my circumstance changes, most people say, 
then everything will be all right. How I many of you know that's not true? Your circumstance can change, but the, like I said before, the problem a lot of times is not your circumstances, it's your emotions. Because a lot of times people's circumstances get their emotions so messed up, then it causes this easement in their body just from that one circumstance. Do you know you can get cancer if you have the right kind of circumstance and then allow your emotions to respond according to that circumstances? It shocks your system into a place and before you know it, uh, cancer cells have sneaked out of their place and now you're struggling with something in your physical body because you didn't know how to, to tame your emotions and take authority of your emotion. This is so, so very serious. So if circumstances could change and everything would be all right, that's not true. That's not true. Everything's not going to be all right just because a few circumstances change. You think it will. Oh, if I only had money to pay all my bills and everything will be all right. No, it's not. Because you're emotional. You don't even know how to control your emotions. You lose your temper all the time. Paying all your bills is not going to make everything all right. Do you know I know people who are out of debt and they're having more emotional problems than they were. They thought the problem was money. The problem's not money. The problem is not having a lot of money or not having no money. Circumstances can affect you some, but that's not the whole deal. You remember the Bible tells, you, told, tell, tells us that godliness plus contentment equals great gain. You got to learn how to be content. You got to learn how to be content. You got to learn how to be content where you are. And the way you, be, you become content is you quit comparing yourself amongst yourself and you start looking at God and thanking him for what he has done for you instead of looking at one another. And it's never enough. It's never enough looking. It's never enough. You got to look at God. It's always going to be enough. You look at one another. It's never going to be enough. Why? Because that's discontentment. Always looking at what somebody else gotten and you thinking that you would be better if you could be in their situation. No, no, no. You've got to learn how to take authority over your emotions. So, yes, while circumstances will have some impact, it's not going to be the whole treatment of what's going on in your life. You got to learn how to. There, there are people I know that live in, in horrible situations, but they got a good attitude. And they're much happier than people that got a whole bunch of stuff. They, I, I know people who who've lost this and lost that, but they had a great attitude and, and they just took it with a grain of salt and just went ahead and deal. And they're much happier than folks who appear to have, every, have everything. You, 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 you're really never going to get nothing until you learn how to be grateful for what you already got. That's right. That's right. Because when you get something more than what you already got, you're not going to have your, your, your ingratitude and your bad attitude is, is going to somehow separate you from from the progress. You got to learn how to be okay with, with you first. And a lot of times when you're not okay with you, you ain't okay with nobody because you mad because you ain't okay with you. If you can be okay with you and then you can be okay with other people and then you can be okay with where you are, who you are, what you got, and then learn how to be happy. You know what Paul said? Paul says, I can be, I've learned how to be content in any situation that I am in. You got to learn how to be that way. All right. So the lights went out. Oh my God, you're miserable and frustrated because your lights went out. Get a candle and some poking beans, get a Bible, pray in tongues, and wait till the lights come back on. What's the matter with y'all? <laughs> Look at Psalms 139 and verse 8. Let this be an encouragement to you that no matter where you are and what happens in your life, let this be an encouragement with you. With you. He says this, Psalms 139, verse 8. I apologize. Psalms 139, verse 8. I told my wife, I said, when we first got married, I, I said, you know what? I, I can stay in a, in, a, in a dirty motel. What's it called? Motel 6. I can stay in a dirty, <laughs> I can stay in a dirty motel 6 as long as I'm there with you. You know, when you with somebody you love, where you staying at? I mean, when you got that real, you know, of course she would be like, well, I ain't staying in no motel six with you right now. But I'm talking about when that, when that, when that love first popped off, you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, yeah. Look at what he says here. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. So no matter where you go, you find the joy in knowing that wherever you go, God's there. Wherever you are and, and uh, 
and, and whoever you're with, God is there. You should rejoice over that. That whatever circumstance I'm with, God's here. Whatever situation I got going on, God's here. The bills need to be paid. God's here. God's here. You've got to be a Christian who can pull that up and say, God's here. All, all will be well. It'll be fine. And constantly walk in faith. I, I freak out over people when I tell them about my testimonies of how I believe God. And they want what I have, but they don't want to do what I say do. That, that blows my mind. Uh, if they have a need, my need is probably way bigger. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, my needs are astronomical as far as where this ministry is concerned. You, can, you know, I praise God for the million dollars we took up for renovation, but a million dollars ain't no money, y'all. Right. Right. You know, right. you got to understand, a million dollars is, is going to get some renovations done. You know, somebody thinking, of, you know, well, a million dollars, we're going to build a whole new, that, 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 that don't cost no million dollars. You know, you're talking about the soft costs and the stuff like that, and million, <laughs> yeah. a million dollars, Chris helped me, I mean, that was about what we did just to grade the place. <laughs> and, and, yeah, it was, it was more than that, just to, to mm -hmm. move trees and get it ready to build something. Mm -hmm. All right. And, uh, and this roof was uh, over, just the roof was a couple million, two million dollars. And I'm just saying, you talk, you talk about you need, you talk about you need a thousand dollars right quick. And on a weekly, day, a weekly basis, I may need half a million, a million dollars just for operating costs. If I let that get to me, it'll mess. I won't be no good for nothing. I won't be no good for nothing. But what I have to do is what I teach. God's there. We did all we can do today. Tomorrow's coming. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's do what we teach people. Sow a seed and believe God. And that's what, that's what we've done. Sow a seed and believe God. And you know what? We've never had like these like gigantic, miraculous manifestations, but we always landed on our feet. Mm -hmm. just, just believe God and you always land on your feet. Other than that, I would be, I'd be messed up by now. I, I wouldn't even be able to talk to nobody. Pastor, how you doing? Baby, don't mess with my now. I'm thinking, <laughs> think my money. need a million dollars by three o'clock, oh Jesus. <laughs> They're going to cut that off. They're going to take this. My attitude now is God's there. If God's for me, who can yeah. be against me? Yeah. It'll be all right. Yeah. It'll be all right. It's been all right all these, what is this, 32 years here? In 32 years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's, it's always been all right. And if, if, if something come up where you can't get it or can't, maybe you didn't need it in the first place. Maybe, well, I lost a new car. Maybe you didn't need the new car. Don't buy a new car that hurts you. New car, what's your, what's your note for the car? That's, a, that's $1,200. That hurt. Take that car back and get out of that pain. <laughs> Somebody said, well, they ain't going to take it back. I said, what'd you do? He said, I drove it up there and left it in front of the gate. <laughs> I don't know how that story came out, but hey, he said, it ain't in my hand no more. <laughs> so we talk about supernatural peace here. Your circumstances is not an excuse for being defeated. Your circumstances will not be an excuse for you being depressed. Your circumstances will not be an excuse for you to be helpless or hopeless. Let me say that again. Your circumstances and the stuff you go through in life, that's not an excuse for you to be depressed. Why? Because you have authority over how you feel. Your circumstances is not an excuse for you to be defeated. Why? You have authority over how you feel. It's not a, an excuse to be helpless. It's not an excuse to be hopeless. Why? You have authority. In other words, you can do something about that. Now, here's what I want to get to today, and I think I'll have time to do this. Go to James chapter 1 and 13. What's, what's then the source of temptation? James chapter 1 and verse 13. Now, as I begin to teach this, uh, this, is, this, is, this is something that's 
pretty radical. James 1.13, let no man say when he is tempted, tested or tried, I'm tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So one of the first steps to overcome negative emotions is to say, Father, it's not your will that I be this way. Say it, Father, Father it's not your will that I be this way. That's the first thing. You, you, you see, right? It's the first thing. It's not your will that I be depressed. It's not your will that I be in grief. It's not your will that I be hopeless. That's not your will. God is not the one who makes people depressed. God is not the one who discourages people. He's not the one to make people angry. He's not the one to make people bitter. That's not God's will for your life. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he with any man, tempted he any man. That's not God. That's your emotions that you're not taking charge over. Now, what causes this? Look at the next verse, James chapter 1, verse 14. But every man is tempted, tested, or tried when he is drawn away, watch this, of his own lust, and he's enticed. Every man is tempted, pressured, tried when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now, he said every man. Everybody say every man. Every man. That means there is no exception. Every man, including all mankind, including every man and every woman. The scripture says that he is enticed or he's drawn away by his own lust. Now, zero in on this word lust. We usually look at this word lust as dealing with some kind of sexual uh, desire. Um, or we look at this word lust as dealing with some type of uh, sexual perversion. Now, even though it applies in this situation, and it would be true just what we read it, I want you to know tonight that the word, this word, and I'm going to prove it, it literally refers to any type of strong emotion. Any type of strong emotion. I'm going to look at three scriptures to show you. This is... This is not like every time you read lust, it's talking about sexual lust. It's talking about, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own strong emotions. He's drawn away by his own strong emotion, and, he's in, and then he's enticed because of that. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. It's any type of strong emotion. Look at James 4 and 5. Lust is used in a positive sense here. In James chapter 4 and 5, he says, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? All right, so you know, you're not, you know the Holy Spirit's not having some sexual perverted desire. So what is he talking about here? Where it says, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to, em to, to envy. This is not talking about the same kind of perversion of our nature. It's talking about the Holy Spirit within us longs for us jealously. That he longs for us jealously. Let me read this in the Amplified Bible. The Amplified Bible says, the spirit whom he has caused to dwell in us, it uses the word yearns. When you, learn, when you yearn for something, you have a strong desire for it. He says that it yearns over us. He yearns for the spirit to be welcome with a jealous love. So here, this is a strong emotion. Here, this is not a sexual perversion. It's a strong emotion. You also uh, look at ex in, in, in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5, it tells us that God is a jealous God. That's an emotion. Now look at Galatians 5. Well, just write this down. Galatians 5, 17, we're told that the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. In other words, it has a strong type of emotion or desire for so all of these scriptures in these verses are talking about the Holy Spirit. So lust doesn't have to refer to the same type of sexual desire that, we've, that the church has taught all these years. It can refer to any strong, overwhelming emotion 
positive or negative. Any strong, overwhelming emotion, positive or negative. Now with that in mind, let's look back at James chapter 1 and 15. James chapter 1, uh, let's look at 14 and read 14 through 15. James 1, 14 through 15. So now I want you to look at this word lust as any type of strong emotion, a strong positive emotion, or it can also be a strong negative emotion. He says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away. Notice, notice when you're tempted. You're tempted by those strong emotions. Notice how the temptation test and trial comes. It starts off with those strong emotions. He says, and then he's enticed. So your strong emotion comes, and then you're enticed. Strong emotions, then you're enticed. Now look at verse 15. Then when those strong emotions have conceived, and so you're going to see here that sin is conceived in strong emotions. When the strong emotions are conceived, it bringeth forth sin. So sin is conceived in those strong emotions. You get angry, you get angry, you get angry, then you hit. Well, where did conception come from to hit somebody? In those strong emotions that you didn't take authority over because you didn't think you had a choice. And so he says, then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and then sin, when it finished, it bringeth forth death. So it, it's through lust or it's through strong emotions that a person is tempted and drawn away into sin. Through strong emotions, the, the temptation for sin happens in those emotions. So sin is conceived in emotions. Whoa. All of the sin you ever do is conceived in your emotion. Negative or positive. Every sin you ever commit is conceived in your emotions first. Let me give you an illustration. A woman has a choice whether or not she, can, she, she wants to get pregnant or not. So if a woman doesn't want to get pregnant, then she should make her choice before she has sex. She shouldn't have sexual relationship that produces children. That's when you decide you don't want to have children. You don't decide you don't want to have children once you've conceived and then you try to have to abort it. I don't want children. I don't have sex. You know, the day is filled with all that stuff. Yeah, but I'm on birth control. Yeah, but he using protection. Yeah, but you know, none of that. <laughs> you know, if you don't want to have children, don't do what you do to have children. That's when you make that decision, right? So likewise, no one would ever commit a physical act of sin if they did not begin to entertain the emotions that conceived that sin on the inside of them. You would never commit an act of sin unless Unless there's an emotion there, unless, unless the, uh, you entertain the emotion part of it. You're not looking at porn if you're not, first of all, having some emotion that you're entertaining. If you don't want to look at porn, don't entertain the emotion. I don't know how, why I keep smoking weed. Because an emotion comes up, you entertain it, and you conceive in that emotion, and now you're smoking weed. Weed didn't start when you struck the match and put it to your lips. It started in your emotion. <laughs> you beat your wife up all the time. I'm trying not to beat her up. You have this emotion thing that happens first, and you conceive being a wife beater in your emotions. You don't want to ever be a wife beater? Don't entertain that emotion. You don't think you have authority over your emotions, and look what's happening. Every sin a man ever commits is conceived in his emotion. And you won't control it. You won't have authority over it. You won't control it. You think it's just supposed to be a response, and your emotion is what's taking you to all those places. Your emotions. Don't you dare blame the devil. Your emotions. Let's look at, for example, suicide. A person would never commit suicide if they would reject the depression that leads to it. Nobody's, nobody's, 
you know, don't pick the gun up and say, what, should I do it or not? That's not when it happened. Right. It happened because that, that emotion was there. You wouldn't reject depression. You said, I'm supposed to feel like this because don't nobody like me. Everybody hate me. That's why I got to eat lunch together by myself all the time every week. You keep entertaining that emotion. You won't control it. And you know what? Suicide is conceived in that emotion. So if they would consider, if they would consider thoughts of depression as sin, if you will consider the thought of beating somebody as sin, if you consider the thought of pornography as sin, if you consider the thought of adultery as sin, consider the thought of it and deal with it, it never gets to this physical place. But you, you know what we say? It's just a thought. <laughs> Ain't doing nothing to nobody yet. <laughs> yet a guy in, entertains himself with kitty porn should not be trusted to keep your children. Because he's been conceiving certain things in his emotions. He hadn't dealt with those emotions. Are you kidding me? And we won't talk about these things in church? And every sin you commit is conceived in your emotions. What would happen if we start seeing that as the beginning part and deal with the emotions? We're no longer casual with it. Well, I'm just not going to deal with the emotion. It's just an emotion. And you just walk around with it. And, and while you're walking with it, now you're considering it and, and you're, con you're entertaining it and you won't cast it down. You won't take a thought. You won't do nothing with it. It's doing more with you than what you're doing with it. And you're surprised, seriously, you're surprised when you end up in an adulterous affair and you've been thinking about it the whole time. Every man I know that's committed adultery conceived it up here first. Wouldn't deal with this. Conceived it up here first. And once they conceived it up here, the sin was born up here. And then all you got to do is, is, is have a baby. Once you conceive it. And that's the wrong time to try to decide whether or not you want to commit adultery. <laughs> That's not the time to do that because now it's born. It's, you're pregnant with it now. Now you got to abort it. It's a lot harder and damaging and, and not recognize these, these emotions. So we've got, we've got generation of church people who've never understood why they keep doing the same thing. Why? Because they thought that emotions were just a response to, a corresponding response to a circumstance and a situation. So... I can't control it. It's not my choice. It just happens. <laughs> yeah, boy, I knew it was going to get silent in this place tonight. <laughs> silent. Good. Good. So if you consider the thoughts of depression and, as sin and resist those thoughts the same way that you would resist the act of suicide, they would never give birth to suicide because it would never be conceived in the womb of your emotions. And we've got a lot of things being conceived in the womb of our emotions. Be interested to see if I gave a pregnancy test, an emotional pregnancy test, it would be interesting to see how many of you are pregnant with something in your emotions that you don't know. If I can just, if I could give me 20 minutes uh, in my office to counsel you and I see what's in your emotions, I'll tell you what your destiny is going to be if you don't deal with it. And I don't even have to be in the spirit. I could tell you that while I'm eating a waffle. <laughs> oh my God. Now, we do this and we know this, know to do this. What I'm just talking about, we know to do this with thoughts. We, we know in 2 Corinthians 10 and 5, we cast down our thoughts. I'm asking you to do the same thing with your emotions. We know that when we have these negative thoughts, cast your thoughts down. And the great thing about casting the thoughts down is that we can kind of get ahead of our emotions, but sometimes we'll cast a thought down in our head and we'll still be emotional about something. And I'm asking you to cast down your emotions just like you cast down your thoughts. My time's up. I am so sorry. Um, you got it? So I looked at it and it's all zeros. Um, uh, we'll, we'll pick up with this. Now, the neat thing about it is on Sundays now, I'm dealing with emotions, so I'll be dealing with this uh, a little bit more. The neat thing about coming to Wednesday night Bible study, you get the, the first, and then you come to Sunday. It's matured. 
how many of y'all came this past Sunday and you came last Wednesday? You, did you get more out of Sunday? Even when you hear it second time and then you add a little more, I might come from a different perspective or stuff like that, you really, really get it. Yeah. And, and I'm thinking right now, you know, a pregnant, emotional person is destined to give birth. Either they're going to have to have an abortion of those, the thing that they born, which is a lot tougher to do to have an abortion of something that you've given birth to. Uh, or you can learn how to say, I am angry, I am depressed, I am bitter. And you can say, these are my emotions, this is how I feel. And you say, I take authority over these feelings, I cast them down, I trust Jesus, and I'll command peace in my life. I command joy in my life. And you use your authority to cast those emotions down. Or you can go get your therapist and pay him for the next two years for him to just tell you cope, 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 cope. And then after you finish coping for a while, you'll feel a little better, but you, you're still not going to be there. You still have the womb that's capable of carrying something and giving birth to it. And I'm telling you how you can be healed from this and become better people. You're going to like yourself better. Other people are going to like you better. Relationships are going to be better. And you're going to be happier regardless of what situation you're in. And things will happen and you'll be shocked of how God can bless a great attitude. It's just your attitude, it is true, determines how high you go. Your attitude can determine your altitude. And for a lot of us, a lot of things we've not been able to accomplish because of our bad emotions and our bad attitudes. And let's just tell the truth. People work with who they want to work with. And if they don't like you, they're not going to want to work with you. They're not going to hire you. Sure. But you come in there with a great attitude. You come in there with be just grateful for everything. And you just don't know. People like, you know, you know, you don't even have all of the requirements, but I like you. I like you. Come on in. We, we'll work this. We're, we're going to work something out. But, you know, coming in with a stinking attitude and blaming everybody for everything that ever happened to you, still blaming your mom and them for what they didn't do and, that's just not going not gonna to work. So, All right, so time's up. If you have anything to be thankful for tonight, would you lift your hands up and give God thanksgiving for that tonight? Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, come on, open your mouth up. Give the Lord a shout that he's worthy of. He's worthy of. Amen. Uh, we'll get into that and then we'll start dealing with different types of emotions. You see why we're going this way to set this all up. So now, once we get to depression and you're talking about, well, how do you cast that down? I'm going to talk to you about what it is, how it operates, how it functions, and how you can easily get rid of it and cast it down and stay on top rather than staying under it. And all, it's all going to be based on what you allow to stay in your, in your mind and what you allow to stay in your emotions. People aren't depressed because something came from the outside somewhere. Depression is a result of stuff that's it's kind of like a slow-moving storm. It just won't move out the way and it just stays there. But there is a way through the Spirit of God for you to deal with it and to gain victory over it. And you will. You will. You will. Amen. I love it sometimes when I see deep spiritual people come in and they hear we're talking about emotions and they get up and say, well, I don't need this. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, Behind that cloak of spirituality is a miserable human being who has no idea how to, how to judge how they feel. They're so sad that they cover it up. How are you doing? This is the day the Lord has made, and I'm full of the joy of the Lord. They are why they're talking to you, and then they go home and cry on the pillow because they, feel, they don't even know how to deal with it. They think it's sin. There's something wrong with you saying, I have any emotions that I need to deal with. And um, so... Anyway, if you need an offering envelope, raise your hands up and ushers, if you'll get the uh, envelopes to them. If you're giving by text, the information is on your screen. And God is good. Amen. God is good. He is good. He is a good God. Amen. I tell you, by the time you get out of this series, you're going to be like, now, it, it'll slip up on you a, a few times, and you'll say, all right, I got this. Ah, okay, yep. I got this. 
I got this. And the more and more you do it, the better and better you'll get. I'm not expecting you to walk out here and, and to perfectly deal with, with your emotions because you're human. And sometimes you're going to blow it. But at least you won't buy the lie that you can't control them. And that's what I'm trying to accomplish in this thing. Don't buy the lie that you can't control them because you can. <coughs> so if you miss it, just admit, I missed it. And watch this. God, help me. Help me, Lord, to have self-control uh, and temperance so I can get to the destiny that you want me to be. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. You ready to give? So, Father, this is our seed that we're sowing tonight, and we're sowing out of gratitude. We're grateful. We're sowing out of cheerfulness. We, we give out of a cheerful heart, Lord, not a heart of complaining or murmuring, but we're just grateful for what you've done in our lives, and we give this gift out of a cheerful heart. We thank you that you receive it, and all is well with our household, our finances, and everything concerning us. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody say it, amen. amen. Let's just go ahead and receive this offering tonight. Amen. Thank y'all for coming to Bible study tonight. Give me somebody to talk to. Amen. Um, if you're here tonight and, you know, you, you say, Pastor Dollar, I need, I need to respond to the altar tonight. He says, man, I need to respond. I heard some things by the Holy Ghost tonight that I, I, I want to respond to it. And if you're not born again, you say, all right, I'm ready to get born again. Maybe it was an area of your emotions that's kept you from making the decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. I don't know. But if you're here tonight and you're not born again and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior tonight,